When last we left the Ewing clan, JR and his adult male companion Alan Beam Alan, Alan Beam. pulled off a twofer by tricking Lucy into getting engaged to Alan and tricking Cliff Barnes into giving up his powerful Ewing throttling job in the Office of Land Management and running for Congress. Now, Project Fool's Gold is going to have some blowback with, who else, Sue Ellen feeling the brunt of it. JR is living the high life. Having escaped the oversight put in place by his father after the Southeast Asian oil fiasco, he gleefully arranges the dagger over Cliff Barnes's heart, and we get to see the consequences play out in real time. Ellen Beam informs Cliff that it's over. They've run out of money, and he's had to pull the newspaper and television ads. Cliff is in denial. He thinks they can use this speech to generate fundraising. But Ellen tells him that the big-time donors need to see results, and they think he's a loser. He advises Cliff to bow out gracefully, Cliff addresses the state of Texas and surprisingly manages not to pull a Bud Dwyer on live TV. Instead, he announces the suspension of his congressional campaign and thanks everyone for their support. He manages to maintain some level of public dignity, being honest about the financial situation instead of making up an excuse about spending time with his family. The Ewing women look on as Cliff bows out. Pamela is in shock. Miss Ellie thinks Digger will be disappointed. Lucy thinks Alan will be crestfallen. And Sue Ellen bitingly says he deserves the failure. Look, I don't know what to say. Uh, maybe you can't fight City Hall? Some people deserve Power. to fail. No lies detected. The Ewing men also watch the speech, looking not at all like an evil cabal bent on world domination. Bobby stays behind a mope because he feels sorry for Cliff. And this is why Bobby is actually the worst. As Cliff pointed out in a previous episode, JR and Jock have no illusions about the awful men that they are. They just justify it by saying, it's an awful world and that's what you have to do to be successful. Sort of moral Darwinism that overlaps pretty snugly with narcissism. I'm indebted to my lovely fiancé for this observation, but Bobby is presented as the moral son who wants to do the right thing and feels bad for people that the Ewing step on. But if you recall, Bobby had spent weeks lobbying the state senate to impeach Cliff Barnes, which would have had the exact same result. Bobby doesn't get to do the sad puppy dog face about Cliff. Running a guy over with a Mack truck or running him over with a sedan has roughly the same outcome in all the ways that are important. A fact that Bobby will find out in a few years. Sue Ellen receives a call from Dusty Farlow, who asks to meet at his hotel room. And if you want a masterclass in editing, acting, and directing small emotional beats, just check this out. Lucy hovers over the call after pertly telling Sue Ellen it's a man. So Sue Ellen tries to discreetly make a date with him over the phone. And then when she hangs up, Lucy gives her this knowing look. And let's face it, if there's anyone who knows what a clandestine phone call disguising a plan for illicit behavior sounds like, it's Lucy freaking Ewing. But in what may be one of my top 10 favorite acting moments of the series, Sue Ellen just gives her this, yeah, you saw what you saw look and struts off. Give Linda Gray all of the Emmys. You know what? I'm filing a grievance. Who won that year? They have to return the Emmy to its rightful owner. Oh. Yeah, okay, I'll allow it. So Ellen makes up some excuse about a surprise party for her sorority sister and makes arrangements for Miss Ellie to watch Baby John. Lucy, who immediately knows what's up, gives this great, good for her look to the camera. I think it's because the main cast of men in this show are presented as being so horrible that the moments of women supporting each other feel so triumphant and authentic. On the opposite end of the triumphant and authentic spectrum, Cliff Barnes confronts JR while he's out having a celebratory lunch with Jock and some of the cartel boys. This is the spinach in the teeth and toilet paper on the shoe performance I was expecting from Cliff in his speech. JR all but admits the plot to drive Cliff out of the OLM was his doing, and Cliff tries to get physical before he's restrained. Cliff is about as broken as he's ever been here, especially since he gave up Sue Ellen and John Ross to get the OLM job in the first place. I thought you loved me. I do. I do, in my own way. But there are things that I need, and I can't have them, and you. Jock lightly scolds JR for breaking Cliff and leaving him with no dignity. But JR shrugs and says Cliff can't touch them, so what does it matter? Speaking of touching, Sue Ellen and Dusty finally get together in his hotel room, and it's about to be the worst possible timing. At Cliff's apartment, a Dallas newspaper reporter shows up to talk to Cliff, 
but instead she gets an earful from an off-the-wagon digger about how Jock screwed him out of all his oil money. He spills the beans about John Ross's paternity to this woman he's known for all of 45 seconds. That's when Cliff comes home and confirms the story. Then the baby is yours. Yeah. Yes, he is. So Ellen grabs Dusty's newspaper and sees that the Cliff Barnes paternity story is front page news, so she rushes out of the apartment to go home. Jock is apoplectic, but both JR and Bobby, who know that Sue Ellen and Cliff did have an affair, are much more measured in their response. She's still not well. Court case like this could send her right back to the sanitarium. When I was a young man, anybody say anything about your mama like that, I'd have killed him. Hey, maybe don't shout that so loudly. You might come to regret it. Sue Ellen arrives home and asks what the plan is. Jock laments that they can't just kill him like they used to in the old days. Now one thing for sure, we can't kill him. But he does say that he'll sick a pack of lawyers on him. After all, it should be easy to prove that John Ross is JR's son with a paternity test. There's no reason why it shouldn't be easy, right? Well, I don't know why you should even ask. Of course it is, Dad. Cliff and Pamela have a rough moral discussion, as she accuses him of being so fixated on JR that he doesn't care about the harm to Sue Ellen and the baby. But he shoots back that he has no way of seeing his own son, and that needs to change. Good points on both sides, although it would have been more believable from Cliff if he had had this energy consistently for the last six months. So Ellen tells Kristen not to pop open the divorce champagne so soon, because JR is unlikely to throw her over. So Ellen is also reluctant to sign off on a lawsuit, which puzzles Harv Smithfield. Harv explains that Cliff doesn't have the kind of money they're asking for, but the Ewings can use the damage to Sue Ellen's reputation to kill any political aspirations Cliff has. Sue Ellen is still reluctant, so Jock morphs into Cotton Hill and tells JR to make her sign the papers. JR, will you tell your wife to sign the damn paper so we can get out of here? Hey, at least he didn't call her JR's wife in the second person. Do like that, he says. Sue Ellen, sign it. Back at Cliff Barnes' new headquarters, this lawyer friend goes over the papers and suggests that Alan Beam might have been in on it. No way, says Cliff, who never met a point he couldn't duck under. They all find out through Messenger that Cliff is being sued for defamation, so they decide to countersue for visitation rights. If it's any consolation, Cliff could probably just get the case thrown out because the process server let Digger sign for the papers. It's so hard to get good process service these days. Sue Ellen returns to Dusty and explains that she can't have an affair with him while she's trying to clear her name of having an affair with the last guy she had an affair with. Dusty is hurt by the revelation that he wasn't her first affair and engages in some light slut-shaming causing Sue Ellen to storm out. At breakfast, Harv shows up to let the Ewings know that Cliff is suing for custody. Sue Ellen refuses to submit to a blood test and storms out of a scene for the second time in three minutes. Is there no place she can find peace? Funny bit is Miss Ellie has to tell JR to go after her. When they're alone, JR tells Sue Ellen he'll drop her like a good habit if he winds up getting embarrassed by all this. Ellie and Lucy then conduct a clinic on dealing with mean girls, as they bump into Marilee Stone and Linda Bradley. Marilee bemoans the fact that Sue Ellen won't be at the Daughters of the Alamo dinner, but Ellie says that she will be there, with bells on. In fact, the whole Ewing family will be there, and Marilee should feel free to stop by for a drink at the pregame party. This was only slightly less satisfying than Julia Roberts taunting the rude store clerk and pretty woman. Oh, you work on commission, right? Uh, yes. Big mistake. Big. Huge. I have to go shopping now. At the ranch, Bobby pledges support for Sue Ellen no matter what happens. This is the first time this season he makes this promise, and it won't be the last. But we'll see how that turns out. Bobby takes a call from Harv Smithfield and tells everyone that the results were inconclusive. Probably because the baby's blood type is scotch. They'll have to do more tests. JR, of course, tries to bribe the doctor conducting the test, but he gets rebuffed. If you're puzzled, yes, the mother is generally involved in paternity testing. Even DNA testing. Cliff and Digger are ready to declare Jock defeated, but Digger's curiosity about the health of the baby, given the possible neurofibromatosis issue, should have tipped them off. That long-sounding name, that disease I gave you. At the pregame party, we get a lot of relevant info dump. Andy Bradley hits on Kristen. Jordan Lee sends the regards of his wife Sarah, who couldn't be at the party because she's due with their baby any day now. And JR cozies up to Marilee Stone, who mentions that the company really belongs to her now that her daddy is dead. JR encourages her to get in the game. 
And finally, Lucy introduces Alan to Linda Bradley. Okay, a number of things stand out about this scene. First is an apparent throwaway line about Marilee Stone being the real owner of Stonehurst Oil. That one will pick up steam in the coming years. It also begs the question, did Marilee kill Seth Stone? I mean, I know that everyone says that he committed suicide after getting screwed over by JR, but Marilee recovers awfully fast for a grieving widow, and maybe she's taking this conversation from JR to heart. Maybe Seth Stone is, you know, just in the way. I'm gonna head cannon it right now. Marilee Stone, Black Widow. Second, stick a pin in the conversation between Jordan and Ellie, because it becomes more relevant vis-a-vis -vis Kristen and Christopher. Third, is Jordan Lee's wife really named Sarah? Her name is Sarah Lee. It's really a shame she missed that party because, you know, nobody doesn't like her. Finally, Linda drops a very telling line about Alan Beam, noting that Lucy always manages to find the most intriguing young men. Uh, the last guy Lucy dated in their circle was Kit Mainwaring. I'm a homosexual, Bobby. Lucy always manages to find the most intriguing young men. That has to be intentional, right? Jock tells JR that the paternity tests are in, but Harv wants to deliver them personally instead of over the phone. Never let it be said that Harv Smithfield doesn't have a flair for the dramatic. Mary Lee overhears and gets a tad too curious about the results. Sue Ellen storms off again and goes for the liquor cabinet, complete with her drunky drunk theme song. She's saved at the last moment by Lucy announcing that Dusty is on the phone again. He apologizes for being a jealous fool and saying mean things because he was hurt. I didn't mean what I was saying. I was jealous. I'll make it up to you. I love you, Zuli. See guys, we can totally own our feelings and still be masculine enough to rock an ascot. JR interrupts, so Sue Ellen makes an excuse to get off the phone in a hurry. This was a really nice moment to give Sue Ellen some relief in the episode, and let the audience know that Dusty is a different type of man that they're used to. Harv arrives with the results. Turns out, JR is the father. You are the father! I mean, who else would Sue Ellen have slept with that has Ewing genetic material coursing through his veins? <clears throat> Jock proposes a toast to JR being the one to impregnate his own wife, which is an awkward thing to toast at a party. I do kind of hope it replaces gender reveal parties, though. That would be way more entertaining. In another great Sue Ellen moment, she tells Harv, JR, and Jock that she's dropping the lawsuit, now that there's no doubt about John Ross's paternity. And when Jock tries to order her to continue, she cuts him off, tells him what's what, and walks away, standing up to him with grace and conviction in a way that her husband never could. JR, will you tell your wife to sign the damn paper so we can get out of here? Do like that, he says. I just to blame men, it's Sue Ellen. Don't you see? It's the only gracious thing to do. Eat a bag of dicks, you old coot. Pamela leaves the party to console Cliff. Cliff is still in denial, thinking that JR must have bribed the doctor. JR must have gotten to the doctor, paid him off. That's impossible, you know it, Cliff. Yeah, I know. Wait. Why do they know? I mean, we saw the doctor turning JR's bribe down, but they didn't. And it's not like it's outside the realm of possibility that JR would just bribe the doctor to fudge the results. Cliff is so bitter he doesn't even care that the baby won't die of neurofibromatosis. You know, the baby that was really important to him earlier in the week? Finally, in the perfect capper to the episode, everyone heads out for the DOA dinner, but JR stays behind and picks up his child for the first time, embracing him and accepting him as his son. And we're out! It's hard to pick a best episode of the third season, but this one, along with Ellie Saves the Day and A House Divided, is right up there. It is the culmination of the B-plot of the season, with JR finally pulling the trigger on Cliff Barnes after Alan Beam loaded the gun and cocked it. Everyone is on their A-game here, including episode scribe Lorraine Dupre and director Harry Harris. There's no fat on this episode, and it just clips along at a brisk pace. Maybe too brisk considering how quickly Cliff threw in the towel, that's a minor point. Everyone gets put through the ringer here, and Sue Ellen actually comes out on the other side stronger for it. Even JR gets a redemptive moment in bonding with John Ross. 
but of course the episode belongs to Linda Gray and Ken Kerchival as Sue Ellen and Cliff. I don't think any dramatic character has been allowed to be so consistently pathetic as Cliff Barnes is in this episode. This is bordering on Frank Grimes' territory. I'm Homer Simpson. <laughs> you wish. And the great thing about the episode, everything Cliff does to retaliate is just drenched in the gravy of failure and sopped up with biscuits of inadequacy. You'd feel sorry for him if this wasn't a bed of his own making. He truly is the Shylock to JR's Antonio. Linda Gray, on the other hand, is just lights out for this entire episode. From her coy smirk to Lucy, to the reserved panic she has to display after the paternity question gets brought up, to the matter-of-fact shutdown of Jock Ewing. She does it all in this episode, and it's a shame she's not more recognized as a great actress. All in all, this has everything a Dallas fan could want. A JR scheme coming to fruition, a lustful affair between Sue Ellen and Dusty, and Cliff Barnes playing the part of punching bag without the dignity. It's just too bad we're about to hit a season three speed bump. Jenna. I was 17 years old, I called my ex-girlfriend cheating on me. You know what she did? She put a brick in her bag and she hit me in the balls with it. My testicles split open and my right one fell onto the ground. I scooped it up and I walked a half a block to the hospital. My bowl was in my hand. You are the father. I told you. I told you I was 